I am Dr. Andrea Lowe and I shall be presenting to you the SGH Rheumatology Rapid Review Series on Systemic Sclerosis. The learning objectives are to understand the clinical features of systemic sclerosis, to be able to distinguish the main subtypes of SSC, to be able to distinguish primary from secondary Raynaud's phenomenon, and to understand the approach to the evaluation and management of systemic sclerosis. There's an incidence of 10 to 20 per million per year for systemic sclerosis and a prevalence of 150 to 286 per million in Western populations and between 20 to 50 per million in Asia. It predominantly affects females with an age of onset between 30 to 50 years. Systemic sclerosis is a multisystemic connective tissue disease characterized by a triad of immune system activation vasculopathy and fibrosis. For vasculopathy, there's obliterative and proliferative microvascular involvement. And for fibrosis, it results from increase of extracellular matrix deposition that affects the skin and internal organs. There are two main subtypes of systemic sclerosis, categorized based on the extent of skin involvement, diffuse and limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis. It is important to note that the diffuse and limited do not refer to the extent of organ involvement, but to the extent of skin involvement. In diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis, this starts distally from the fingers and extends proximally above the elbows and knees. Skin involvement in the limited subtype also starts in the fingers, but does not extend proximal to the elbows and knees. The face may be involved. Limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis used to be known as the crest syndrome, denoting calcinosis, Raynaud's phenomenon, esophageal dysmotility, sclerodactyly, and telangiectasia. Other subtypes you need to know about include the systemic sclerosis overlap syndromes. Systemic sclerosis may overlap with one or more of the other CTDs, and if features of all three are present, especially with the presence of NTU1 RMP, it is known as mixed connective tissue disease. Another small group of patients with systemic sclerosis, Sini scleroderma, have typical features of systemic sclerosis but without skin involvement. It is important to understand the unique features of the diffuse and limited subtypes as they run different disease causes, have different autoantibody associations, and are at risk of different organ complications. Knowing the difference helps with the overall management of systemic sclerosis. The interval between Raynaud's phenomenon and skin sclerosis onset is short in patients with a diffuse subtype, typically within 1 to 2 years, compared to up to 10 years in those of the limited subtype. Early in the disease course, patients with diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis may have swollen and edematous fingers, arms and legs that may be mistaken for arthritis or peripheral edema, whereas those with limited subtype may have intermittent puffy fingers. In addition, the tempo of progression is different. In patients with diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis, 80% of organ involvement occur in the first three years of disease onset. So, for example, a patient whom I see in clinic for the first time reports Raynaud's phenomenon onset one year ago whose skin involvement that is distal to the elbows and knees started only six months, could still be evolving and be of the diffuse subtype. This patient requires close monitoring for disease progression and organ involvement. Conversely, a patient whom I see in clinic for the first time with an eight-year history of Raynaud's phenomenon and sclerodactyly is likely to be of the limited subtype. Telangiectasia and calcinosis are common and occur early in those with limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis. Typical organ involvement is outlined in this slide. I just want to highlight that gastrointestinal involvement can occur commonly in both subgroups. And whilst it's commonly known that interstitial lung disease occurs more frequently in those of the diffuse subtype, it can also occur in those with limited subtype. And this often is driven by anti-SCL70, which is a risk factor for interstitial lung disease. Finally, the autoantibody profile and its association with different organ complications are outlined in this slide.
The history and examination needs to be focused on the following aspects of disease. Vascular component, musculoskeletal, gastrointestinal, noting that the whole GI tract may be involved. Renal, particular renal crisis, however this is rare and tends to occur in those with diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis, especially in the early part of the disease, and it can be associated with the use of corticosteroids. Other manifestation includes cardiac manifested by cardiomyopathy and arrhythmias. Lung is an important complication of systemic sclerosis, typified by interstitial lung disease and pulmonary arterial hypertension, which are leading causes of death in systemic sclerosis. ILD particularly has the highest risk of worsening in the first five years of disease onset. Sclerodactyly refers to skin thickening and tightening of the fingers only. Digital tough resorption is visualized on x-ray as acroosteolysis and is a result of the vascular complications of systemic sclerosis. You see here also a healed digital ulcer. Multiple telangiectasia are seen on this lady's palm. This is distinguished from the vasculitic rash of systemic lupus erythematosus as it is blanchable. There is also finger pulp atrophy seen here with flattening of the normal curvature of the pulp. This slide demonstrates the diffuse skin sclerosis that extends above the elbows in this patient. Note also the joint contractures seen in this patient's hands. Raynaud's phenomenon seen in this pair of hands shows clear demarcation of the pale um, face of Raynaud's phenomenon. Raynaud's phenomenon was first described by Maurice Raynaud in the 19th century. It is due to an exaggerated vascular response to cold temperature or emotional stress. Abnormal vasoconstriction of digital arteries and cutaneous arterioles due to a local defect in normal vascular response is thought to underlie the disorder. The typical triphasic color change is white that denotes vasoconstriction, blue denoting the ischemic phase and red denoting reperfusion. There is a sharply demarcated color change of the skin, which typically affects the fingers and toes, but can occur in the ears, nose and tongue as well. It is relatively common with a prevalence of 5-15%, to with geographic distribution reported to be more prevalent in countries with a cold climate. It is important to distinguish between primary and secondary Raynaud's, as the former does not require any follow-up and does not result in any complications. Secondary Raynaud's phenomenon may be due to a whole host of different causes outlined on this slide. There are some clinical clues that may help to direct further investigations as indicated. Involvement of the thumb may point to a secondary cause. How do we evaluate Raynaud's phenomenon? These are three screening questions that you may ask, and Raynaud's phenomenon may be determined to be present if all three responses are yes. Next, do a careful history, which includes the age of onset, family history, the symmetry of involvement, digits involved, and the severity. For example, does it complicate with digital ulceration or the patient gets numbness? this is more likely to be due to a secondary cause. Note the different triggers and secondary causes. Further investigations would include ESR, antinuclear antibody if indicated, and a nail-fold capillaroscopy. Vascular studies do not have to be done for everybody, but only as indicated, for example, if there is a blood pressure difference between the arms or there is absence of pulses. We see here the nail fold capillaroscopy setup, which is done as a non-invasive procedure where a drop of oil is placed at the base of the nail fold and visualized under a microscope. Classic systemic sclerosis pattern of dilated capillaries with capillary loss may be present in more than 95% of patients with systemic sclerosis. It can also help with the diagnosis of dermatomyositis and in patients with mixed connective tissue disease. 
Other systemic sclerosis related autoantibodies are anticentromere, anti SAL70, anti TH2, and anti RNP polymerase 3. In the presence of Raynaud's phenomenon, an abnormal neophil capteroscopy with SSC pattern, and the presence of SSC associated antibodies predisposes one to have systemic sclerosis. This is the latest 2013 classification criteria for systemic sclerosis. It is more sensitive than the 1980 criteria as this allows more patients to be classified as systemic sclerosis early on in their disease. In particular also, it helps with the classification criteria of limited cutaneous subtype and those without skin involvement, i.e. the Cine scleroderma subgroup. It also addresses the three hallmarks of systemic sclerosis, i.e. fibrosis, as reflected by skin sclerosis and interstitial lung disease, for example, vasculopathy, by recognizing the importance of fingertip lesions and the value of neophil capteroscopy, and autoimmunity, which is characterized by the presence of SSC-related autoantibodies. A score of greater or more than 9 would suggest systemic sclerosis. This is the diagnostic approach to working up a patient in whom you suspect to have systemic sclerosis. So some of the red flags suggesting early SSC would be Raynaud's phenomenon or puffy fingers. If a patient has one or two of these features, then you would want to order an autoantibody profile or a nail capilloscopy. Then the next level of workup would be to investigate for typical organ involvement with a baseline chest X-ray or HRCT scan of the lungs, for example. Next, the management. There is a window of opportunity to treat patients, especially the diffuse cutaneous subtype, whereby 70 to 80% of major organ involvement occurs in the first three years of disease. Thereafter, 20 to 30% of organ involvement occurs. The approach would be to first determine the subtype and then determine whether they have early or late disease in relation to the onset of skin sclerosis and Raynaud's phenomenon. And finally, to determine the type of organ involvement and severity. And for this purpose, the modified Rodman skin score is very useful. The above helps to prognosticate to determine the treatment approach. Management and treatment depends on the organ involved. So for example, in patients with rapidly progressive skin involvement, you might want to consider immunosuppression with methotrexate or cyclophosphamide or mycophenolate morphotil. Those with extensive interstitial lung disease or worsening lung function will require cyclophosphamide or mycophenolate morphotil. Raynaud's and its complications need to be managed accordingly. Patients with Mild Raynaud's may get away with lifestyle changes and keeping warm centrally, putting on gloves and avoiding the cold. Those with complications will need to be treated more aggressively. The presence of ACE inhibitors has changed the survival and outcome of renal crisis significantly, such that it no longer is the major cause of mortality nowadays. These are some of the PAH-specific therapies Phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors such as sildenafil, endothelin 1 receptor antagonists such as busantan, and prostacyclin infusions. Gastrointestinal tract involvement is symptomatically managed currently with potent pump inhibitors, promotility drugs, and rotating antibiotics in those with small bowel and bacterial overgrowth. Nutritional support is also very important. Other more novel treatments which are currently done under research include autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplant and antifibrotics such as frizolimumab, which is an anti-TGF beta. So in summary, I've outlined the clinical features of systemic sclerosis, distinguished between the diffuse and limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis subsets. I've outlined the differences between primary and secondary Raynaud's phenomenon, its evaluation of Raynaud's phenomenon and also suspected systemic sclerosis, the approach and management of systemic sclerosis. Thank you.